Ha. A new art station challenge. So, there is a new art station challenge. Where do we begin? Well, I am hosting the carriage design challenge along with Susanna Helmick this year. And of course, uh, why not start with the challenge page? So you're gonna read through here, find out exactly what's required of us, um, exactly what we have to deliver. So in this case, untamed, when animals rule the world, read through this, and then make sure that you are familiar with the brief. In this challenge, you'll design eight animal slash creature characters. At least two of these must be bipedal characters. So this is probably the most important part here. And in general, it's really good to just make sure you don't forget these things. So I'm gonna take this bit and make sure I save it somewhere. And because we've just started a challenge, where best to save it? Well, let's open up a PureF document. Um, so PureF is what I use to collect all my references for things like this. I suspect um, a lot of people do. And if you haven't already got PureF, downloaded it, you should. It's fantastic, it's free, you can donate if you want to, and it's the best place to organize all of your reference. So what I'm gonna do here is open up a new PureF file. You can press Control N to make a note, and I can just copy that into here. So here we go. This is the most important line probably in the challenge. Now we've got it saved, we're never gonna forget it. So nothing I can add here. Let's just call this Untamed. Now we've got a nice little title. We've got the basic part of the brief. And if we really wanted to, we could copy this whole little brief in here. Keep that around in case we need it. So where would we begin? Well, if you're feeling particularly uninspired, no worries, we've got Google. I don't know uh, at the moment what sort of creatures are inspiring me to create some characters. So why not ask Google for inspiring looking animals? As dumb as it sounds, this kind of thing can actually be a great start for what you want to create. Um, typically things become popular and sort of well-known or most likely to come up in a Google search if they're interesting or they stand out for a reason. So why not search interesting animals, inspiring animals? Um, basically any sort of buzzword plus what you're looking for and you'll start to get some interesting results. Look at this guy, he looks crazy, he looks great. Drag him in. Um, this might be something I want to draw him in the future. Like, it's a really, really cool design with those big eyes, the, the tiny little pupils in the middle. We're also seeing, like, fun materials that we might want to use later on. Look at this nice subsurface through the ears. You can see the little veins running through. You know, immediately, once we've got something to look at, we can start to pick out bits that actually interest us and that we might want to include in our own artwork. And so then continuing on from this, perhaps we do something aquatic-themed or we take aquatic creatures and introduce those to land animals somehow. So this is like a great start for getting an idea of what what looks appealing to you. Ultimately, you want to create something that you like the look of. And since we're taking all of our inspiration from animals, why not start with the animals that look interesting to you? All right, nice. We've got some cool pictures of animals. Um, something that we want to do just to make it easier to uh, look at all of these references on our board. We can press Control alt left or up. I find up generally works because it makes the same height of the images. And then you can just press Control p and this is gonna organize them all into a nice grid for us. We can scale up and down, move around. It just neatly organizes all of them so that you can see them all at the same scale. Brilliant. But this isn't very organized, is it? We haven't really got a core idea yet. We've just got some like starting points, things that maybe feel interesting, but uh, we have no idea how to use. So the next part of this is we need to start thinking, uh, using our brain a little bit, what can we actually do to tie all of these designs together? Um, the reason I would actually go for images first is because having some foundation of some visuals which are starting to get you interested can help you problem solve in this next stage. So for me, this next stage is what is the actual challenge again? Um, we have when animals ruled the world. And if we take that little part of the brief, um, we can start to work out potentially what this means. So when animals ruled the world, is this when animals came to rule the world or is it a timeline where humans didn't exist? So these are potential uh, ways that we can kind of approach this scenario. Have humans gone extinct? We can type in humans disappeared or humans never evolved. So this feels like a, a nice way to split the two potentialities. And then you can start to work out what might have happened for this to, to be the case. So um, did animals outcompete them? And if that's the case, how would animals outcompete them? Did they become more intelligent or were they a violent uh, uprising where animals became stronger than the technology that humans had to keep them down? So animals overpowered humans. So this is like a, a way that we could start to see how a history might have unfurled for animals to actually take over and rule the world. And then on this side, if humans never evolved, then perhaps we would start to look at 
What kind of creature would evolve to take their place? So what could this be? Humans took over because they learned how to use tools. They started to make um, more efficient use of the environment around them. Therefore, what happens if animals were doing the same thing? So tool use. Um, the next big evolution for humans was farming. Um, what do animals do to make their sort of feeding habits more efficient, more effective? Essentially, that's the equivalent of farming for humans. Perhaps back on this side, um, thinking about how animals overpowered humans. This could be through a combination of intelligence and uh, physical power, or it could be like basically them becoming more monstrous through intelligence, through some sort of like organized uprising. And then on this side, I'm imagining something more like an alien species. They would, you know, potentially have high, uh, more technology, more intelligence, and basically just be more organized than humans could be. That's how they would come along and take over and then have humans start to cooperate with them and then eventually just phase out because humans were <laughs> just not evolved to compete. They evolved faster than humans could and ended up taking over. Perhaps the, uh, the fun thing that could come from this is maybe humans as pets, for example. Um, twist the dynamic that we currently have with some animals. If animals to us at the moment are pets because they are less intelligent than us, then if we flip that on its head, now the animals are more intelligent than us. What would it be like for humans to be pets? And if that was the case, what needs to exist in a society of animals that is so much more advanced than humans that humans are just left to kind of do what they're doing at the moment? And that kind of behavior being so much more dumb than what the animals are doing, but they're just treated as pets. So that's an interesting way to go. It feels a little sci-fi perhaps, um, something I think this is kind of unique for, especially compared to the previous challenges, which have been quite space and alien themed, um, is maybe stuff which is more wild. Um, a little more instinctual. And that brings me on to the next bit, the next way you can explore this theme. These are sort of different stories that we're sort of looking at. So we could put this subtitle as the story or world building. But then on this side, maybe we go for um, mood slash vibe. So this is where we're thinking less about exactly what the story is, but more about what makes these untamed characters particularly interesting and particularly sort of unique from stuff that's come before. So we can start to just brainstorm uh, words that feel like they fit into this um, into this theme. So wild, organic, nature, we can put untamed. And these as little starting points, these can actually be really helpful because you can now go back to our good friend Google, um, type in something like wild and then just put synonyms afterwards. Um, how would we get sort of more interesting information from this word, well, just look for similar words. You can see we've got untamed here, things like feral, that's great. Um, and you can see that this starts to lead into other words like fierce, a little more specific, but very much linked to this mother word. And this is where we might also start to think about, we're gonna make eight characters. We've gotta make all of those feel distinct from each other and interesting. We can't just copy the same ideas over and over. So fierce could be one of those. And then underneath, things like rugged. Rugged is a nice one. That feels like a, a, a great word to sort of inspire the sort of textures or whatever that might go onto the, the hide of an animal. And then what we've got down here, we've got raw. Raw is a nice one. Howling, raging. And so essentially you can start doing this for a while. So if we start to sort of group these uh, a little more sensibly, these are kind of like a subset of feral, so we can kind of organize them like this. And then something that we might do for organic is do our little word search on Google. And if this doesn't then help us particularly much, like animate, lively, living, natural, biotic. Those aren't really conjuring any particular visuals to mind. And so I can st start to rely on my own knowledge. Um, if I think about organic, I might think about sort of growths. So if I type organic into Google Images instead, obviously the first thing that comes up, it's all plant produce. What sort of growths would I expect to see? Um, and so we could go down the sort of the plant route or we could think about things like moss, um, lichen, and these would start to give us ideas for like surface textures and stuff. You could do this in uh, Photoshop, you could write it down by hand. I just find it's easier here because now, once you've got this um, little layout, if we want to go into feral and roaring, this is where we do our next step of image searching. And this is a good start. We can start to think about um, what works so well about this image in particular, and then what might we want to do to sort of make it interesting, make it new and make it our own.
All right, that's enough of that. I've already started to go <laughs> off tangent, but this is the sort of research which ideally you do for all of the characters. If humans are kind of just out of the picture, they're not really involved in this world. We just pretend that they don't really exist. So instead, what kind of creatures would have evolved and taken their place? Um, I really like the idea that essentially we want to try and make these new characters or creatures, we want to make them similar to humans in a way that we can relate to them. And so treating them in the same way as in how would an, an animal changed after they started to use tools or they started to um, do some sort of like farming techniques. I think that's really interesting because it's like a, a retelling of, of the story of the human evolution and we're sort of finding new parallels, like a way that humans can understand um, what we're designing, but we're putting like an animalistic spin on it. So that's kind of the idea here. Um, and I immediately then, I found some interesting article about, I think it was specifically an army ant and how their jaws are used as like makeshift sutures because they clamp on and hold a wound closed and don't let go. I thought that was really interesting. That basically then just sparked the idea of, oh, okay, um, we've got this one little link We've got to start from somewhere. Perhaps one of our creatures is insect based and they're like the equivalent of a medical professional. So it's like the doctor of the group. And I've got ahead uh, of where we really should be at the moment, but I then just started reading articles about specific uses of uh, bugs and things in medicine. And that was really interesting. I just made quick notes of all of these things. These are either notes that will directly go into the design or notes that mean I can go and research it when I'm actually doing any sort of like visual designing. And then down at the bottom, I just have like some ideas that popped into my head whilst Googling around. This sort of stuff is a bit more couched in like entertainment design rather than looking for scientific real world uses of insects. I'm just thinking, okay, um, if I was going to replace the modern tenets of medicine, so for example, you get a cut in your arm, um, normally we put a bandage around it and seal it with some like some set of tape or like a uh, medical tape. Cool. Uh, what would the animal equivalent be? And in this case, what would the um, the insect equivalent be? Well, instead, perhaps this sort of flexible material. Maybe there's something in the environment that they'd use, something like a flexible leaf, something a bit more natural, or they use some sort of insect wing. Um, those are kind of flexible. They look kind of breathable because they've got the transparent uh, translucency. And so I was like, well, maybe you use that as a bandage instead. Then some sticky secretion for the wound uh, dressing, and then so on and so on. Like you can start making up interesting ideas that draw from uh, our real experience with medicine and then start to put the animalistic uh, twist on it. So taking a step back again, well, at this point, I'm sort of settled that this is my core idea. Humans never evolved. And so the thing that we're gonna focus on is what do animal tools look like and what, do, what does animal farming look like? Um, if they were the ones doing the farming and creating the tools. Because we're trying to basically make animals um, go through the same evolutionary stages as humans, um, and ultimately we want to be able to relate to them as humans, I'm thinking that um, these animals take on human-like traits as their intelligence increases. So essentially, I'm thinking that the way that we make these animals feel somewhat uh, relatable is we start to give them similar features as humans have. Um, obviously, at least two of our characters need to be um, bipedal, as we have here. Remember our, our brief? <laughs> always always worth going back and checking this. At least two of them will be bipedal creatures. Great. So um, that's one thing to bear in mind. That's one way that you can look somewhat humanoid. Another way is in just body proportions, um, maybe things like um, the way that their hands work, like do they have more developed hands? If it's uh, coming from like a wolf or a tiger or something, do you give them the all-important opposable thumbs? Those are the sort of things that I'm thinking with like taking on human-like traits. And also facial structures, maybe it becomes a little clearer that they have more room for a brain, a larger brain, and then slightly more um, human-like features, perhaps they don't have the, um, the prey eyes anymore. That's a big one which sort of distinguishes um, animals in the wild, basically animals that have a really wide field of view to check out for predators and make sure that they're not being chased versus um, predators which then have a, a fairly narrow field of view but because they are able to look at an ob one object with both eyes at once you get depth perception and can therefore more accurately track how close something is. This is basically um, the uh, what I'm trying to describe. And perhaps it's then actually worth dragging this in 
um, because this might be an extra thing to help us distinguish between intelligent animals and less intelligent animals. Because perhaps we actually feature some of those animals in this lineup. So imagine an intelligent animal that's using a less intelligent animal as some sort of work beast in the same way that humans use an ox to pull a cart, for example. We could actually fit this into our lineup of characters um, and ways that we could then show how the characters are different is using tips like this. So basically it's worth just documenting all of the ideas you're having as you have them um, because that way you're not losing track of anything. You don't have to have this settled yet at all but um, another first step and this could actually help you find your story is to start to think about what your total, what your complete lineup actually looks like. So this gives us um, a way to think about how to design our characters and then another um, good starting point is to think about what kind of range we want our characters to cover. A great way to start thinking about what characters we actually want to design is to think about the categories that we can put each of these um, each of these characters into. So in this case, these are just different animals. They're different sizes, different shapes, they have different um, uh, surface textures, different colors, all great stuff. Um, this is all something we want to mimic with our lineup. We want there to be variation across them but something maybe that holds them all together and makes them distinct from another, another lineup of characters. And ultimately that's probably going to come in the style in which you create them in, mostly. Mostly the style will actually link these together, but also that backstory, that world building, whenever you come up with um, your plan for how to link all of these characters together. First though, this might be it. We just want to make sure that there's variety and then a shared visual language. So going into here, we can start to describe exactly what this is. So um, one route, potentially. And again, these are just ideas that you kind of have to think up, um, think for uh, as many sort of ways that you can categorize things. Um, I'm already inspired by my inf uh, research into that medical beetle. Perhaps we go for replacing different professions and different um, categories that we have as humans, but replacing them with animals. So we might have uh, a medical themed um, creature. We might then have, if we're going down the list, something which is more like military based. So uh, these these are very loose in what they mean to me. Like military doesn't have to be organized military. It could just mean someone that's uh, hired or used for protection. Basically something that's bigger, beefier, um, designed to protect others. And then we could go for maybe like teacher, uh, maybe builder, uh, food. So food can be split into like um, serving and preparing. What does like a a gourmet dish look like if it's in the animal kingdom. We could go for sort of just like represents family. Um, it's very vague, but it's it's something which kind of gives us an idea of how we fill in the gaps in between all of this. So what does it look like when any of these characters are sort of at home, whatever that home is, we don't even know yet. Yeah, and what, what, does, that, what does that come across as? And actually, um, I don't know if I saved it here, but there was that cute photo of the possum um, with all of the babies attached to its back. And this is why uh, getting this like little starting point of, of images just to have something in the back of my head for, uh, for reference. That's why it's so useful to have done this at first, because now when I'm going through uh, this section where I'm starting to try to find ideas, I can remember the stuff I've already looked at. For example, um, having put down the sort of military uh, sort of archetype, perhaps this is where I want to use the armadillo, because that's like a, a great way to sort of represent uh, being armored, being protected and maybe being protective of others. And then family, this is just too cute. It's a clear sort of indication of family. Great, that could be the route that we go down for this character. And obviously we could continue this. We could need a few more because we need to get eight total. Um, but for now, this is good. So as you can see already, I'm starting to assign like a potential animal to each of these. That's another great way to think about getting variation. Do we just want like one different animal as the base of the design of each of our characters? Um, and another way to approach that would be do we want an animal from like every part of the world? Um, the whole uh, challenge is is referring to animals taking over the world. So do we want to perhaps make sure we have a full range of biomes in which these animals would live in? Maybe we want to design a creature that lives in the desert, temperate regions, Arctic, rainforest, ocean, swamp, tundra. You can start to get more and more specific with each of these, but this is actually a good start. This is enough. Um, we could even just take four of them and put two creatures in each. That would be a perfectly viable way. Um, and when you start to make these little lists of categories, 
Um, you can also line them up. So you don't have to just take the desert as your starting point for your character. We can actually start to um, put all of these together. So in fact, if I leave those up there and then just copy them over, if we just assign them one-to-one, -one, we now have um, an ever sort of increasing specificity for each of our characters. You can then switch them around. Maybe I want to assign them like this instead, giving yourself a bit of restriction so that you can then be creative on top of it. So we get military, we get desert, we can take those, put them together, and this is the next sort of character brief that we've we've got up. Obviously you just need to go and do this um, and do it as, as much as you like. You could go and, <laughs> and do this kind of research for hours. Um, but oftentimes it might also be best to pick one like you've, we've got here and start to just uh, ideate in uh, Photoshop instead. So let's do that. Open up Photoshop, new file, and we need to give ourselves a decent amount of space. So depending on what your PC is capable of, go for a nice big file. Um, and I'm not actually going to do too much in the way of sketching, um, sketching specific ideas. Instead, I'll take my tablet out. I'm thinking more about the overall picture. So in the same way we've just designed the overall uh, idea for our character lineup, we've got an, a rough idea of the backstory and we're starting to get fairly specific with some of the creatures. Um, something which I actually saw um, people do in previous challenges is to get a huge image, um, get a big blobby brush, I think we'll just go for a round brush, um, and then start to design silhouettes. So if you want to have variation across your entire lineup, then maybe we want something which is big and round. Then we could have a, a creature which is kind of like small and square. And then we could have like a big and squarish thing um, with like sort of sharp edges. Um, and then the next one could have spikes and the next one could be long and, and wavy. And that could do something kind of more feline, like uh, it might have legs coming down and then sort of like swooshy tail. And like this stuff, it's almost more like a less, less that we're trying to do a specific these are actually legs. Um, it's more just getting the vibe, something in which we can then apply to um, a real design later. And then we may want something which is like sort of top heavy, um, maybe like this. We could go for something which is really small, uh, perhaps with like little thin bits coming off it. This could be sort of something more like insect-like. And essentially trying to do this with abstract shapes, it's a great way to try and enforce variation early on. You don't want to be stuck having um, a bunch of characters which are all based on like different big cats. That could be an interesting way to um, to formulate your um, your design lineup. You could take one specific thing and then try and get as much variation from it as possible. But if that was the case, um, you wouldn't just have like your your cat shape like this. Actually, this looks more like a monkey. Imagine the same example but with monkeys. Um, you wouldn't want your lineup to end up looking like this, where essentially it's kind of like the same monkey over and over, but maybe scaled slightly differently, just a little bit. Like, this is a lineup of characters is is ultimately not very interesting. Um, even if we sort of like uh, flip them around, stuff like that, or you know, have them sitting down, the the general vibe that we're getting from this is a lot of the same weight uh, of like the visual weight for each of them, and a lot of similarity between them. Um, so instead. You know, once we've got this kind of like rough lineup of of characters, we can think about how to apply something specific to them. So, if we want one to be bulky, then we really make sure that like we bulk this stuff up and maybe go for like thick and short limbs. And that's a way to sort of make this one stand out from the others. Maybe it could still have that tail to sort of contrast, and that could be quite interesting. And it could have like a small head to sort of emphasize how big it is. Um, cool. And now with this one actually does stand out from the lineup. We're starting to get some specific relationships of proportions and shape within it. Nice. It could be quite big as well. Um, and then this one here, perhaps we want to go for something which is actually more elegant. So we're thinking, how do we go for elegance? Well, perhaps we go for sort of something sort of thinner. We could have like uh, some more like gentle curves or something in these these limbs. And then there could be like a like a smooth uh, waving curve, like an S curve versus sort of like the, the harder masculine shapes here. So again, this now really stands out from this this creature here. Um, it's something which is sort of like smooth and wavy, um, has a bit more um, subtlety to it. 
And then this one, if it's sitting up like this, maybe we go for something which can have like a bit of personality to it. Maybe we make it a lot more lazy. So it's something which is kind of like sitting on its back, um, kind of like that. You know, you can imagine that it might have its legs kind of spayed out in front of it. Maybe the legs could be really big. Up to this point, the body's always been the dominant shape. So maybe we actually um, flip that on its head, make the legs bigger, make the arms um, smaller instead. And maybe we could actually show those little arms coming into the middle like this, with these big chunky legs to the side. And so you can see that these all share the same features, like they're all um, four-legged, they have a head, they have perhaps ears and a body. But we're starting to get like um, a really nice variation across them just by thinking about shapes and the rough um, relationship to each other. This is a great way to start with your lineup. Um, ultimately, of course, you need to have eight of these. So if I duplicate these again, this would be our final lineup. Something again, if you go back and look at previous challenges, um, it's quite a popular thing to take one of these and make them huge. Like, it's not necessarily um, something you have to do, but we could take influence from, you know, an elephant compared to most animals. It's like an order of magnitude bigger. And because of that, it gives you that really nice comparison. Sure, it was a bit bigger before, um, you know, it's definitely chunkier than the rest of these, but overall its dimensions, like the box at which it fits in, it's almost the same as this elegant one here. Whereas this makes it very clear that this is a different scale of creature. And then we can do the same thing with one of these. Like one of these could actually be properly small. Um, again, totally different scale, and it just adds that much more variation because of it. We're all familiar with big, medium, small in shape design. Um, apply that to your um, lineup of characters. Like try and get this level of uh, size variation. It's not necessary, again, but the the effect is generally that it gives you something which feels more diverse. And if you imagine the world that these creatures live in, now we can sort of really think about the different environments that a small creature like this would be able to fit into versus like the giant um, structures that would be required to house a creature like this. And perhaps, therefore, they don't have any structures, you know, they could find their own shelter a different way. Or shelter is then built into them, so they could have some sort of like big spine. This could be our pangolin, for example, which has like um, big scales all over it. And, um, you know, when it goes to sleep, it just rolls up into a big ball. So this is essentially like the kind of fluidity and um, freedom that you should be having in your um, early exploration. Once you've gone through all of this, um, you're then sort of ready to start uh, bringing together your research and this lineup of creatures that you've got here and start to pair them off with each other. And so this could be our, like, our big insect uh, doctor character. Uh, this one looks almost more like a, a cute cockroach, of course just play around with these silhouettes. You could do something completely different, a little more ant inspired, where it's kind of like the big head and then the segmented body. And with all of this, you know, have fun with these shapes because um, they will let you get the expression in um, that you want. All that stuff, very, very easy to, to test out now when you're really just making broad strokes changes. And I think that will do it for this introduction to how you can um, start to get your ideas together. I hope that's helpful. And I can't wait to see what you come up with. Bye-bye.